For those who, who don't know Fanula, she is a, a botanist and director of ecology at Beck Consultants based in Dublin. And she's been working on grasses and grasslands for more than a decade now and was instrumental in the Irish Semi-Natural Grassland Survey back in 2008, which covered grassland habitats across Ireland, including wet, dry, calcareous, and acidic grasslands, and pretty much everything in between. She's also done quite a lot of training um, for places like UCC, the Data Center, and CIEM, among many others. So she really knows what she's talking about, and it's really great that we can have her here for this today. So thank you very much, Fanula. And with that, off we go. Great. Okay. <laughs> thanks very much, Sarah. And thanks to BSBI as well for inviting me to give this, um, this webinar. Um, delighted to have a chance to try and introduce people to, um, to grasses in general, and maybe just to try and take away some of the fear that's associated with grasslands and grasses. And um, I'll, I'll take you through, uh, I'll tell you what the webinar will be covering now. First of all, I just want to again acknowledge the support of the National Parks and Wildlife Service and, and CEDAR for um, the Centre for Environmental Data and Recording for supporting um, this project. Um, it's, it's great, it get, it'll get people inter interested in grasses. And um, I mean, we can just see from the amount of people who've signed up to the webinars, just the amount of interest there is out there for, for them. So it's absolutely brilliant. So in terms of today's webinar then, what I'm going to cover is um, just a very brief introduction on why grasses matter. And again, the interest in the webinar means that I'm pretty much preaching to the converted here. Um, what equipment do you need to ID them? Um, and the answer is very little, and I'll bring you through that. And as I say, I just want to try and take the, the dread and the fear um, that people have uh, about grasses and try and remove that and maybe try and demystify them a little bit. Go through the overall structure of grasses, um, look at the characteristics of the flowering head, um, and help uh, maybe give you other characters that will help with um, IDing them as well. And I suppose the idea of all of this, while I'm not actually going through, I'm not taking you through a kind of a, a structured keying out process where you have your, your either or statements, what I'm giving you is the, the tools that will help you work through a key yourself so that you'll know what it means when it's talking about tufted growth or, you know, a inflorescence is a panicle and all this kind of stuff. So try and just to introduce you to some of the terminology that will help you when you're looking through these ID books. I'm going to go through uh, some of the top, as I say, 20-ish, <laughs> depending on time. And also there's, there's a, um, maybe 15 or 20 grass species that are very common and that would be good for you to try and get to grips with. Um, and once you start with the, the basics, and the easy ones, then you can kind of progress to more difficult ones after that. And finally, then just what's next for you? How do you go further with your, in, you know, with your grass ID um, endeavors? Um, where can you go for extra help or um, extra maybe information, things like that? We'll just bring you through that very briefly at the end. Okay, so first thing there, grasses. Why do they matter? Okay, why, why do we have so many people um, logging on to this session at the moment? Uh, well, the grass family itself is the fifth largest in terms of species in, in the world. So, um, and it's also the most widespread plant type um, globally. So you have your forests and everything else, but the, the actual grass family itself covers pretty much every continent of the world except um, I think Antarctica. So grasslands, um, grasslands essentially are where your vegetation is dominated by grasses and herbaceous perennials. In other words, they're not woody species, they're not trees. And grasslands represent about a third of all the vegetation cover um, on the globe um, and about 70% of the world's agricultural land. So if you think of cereal crops, they're all grasses, member of the grass family. 
And in terms of Ireland itself, we've got about 75 to 80% of Ireland is under grassland. Now, most of this is improved agricultural grassland, but some of it is semi natural grassland as well, with quite a good diversity of, of grassland, of grasses and herbaceous, um, non woody perennial flowering species as well. And so, why, um, why does everyone want to learn? To identify grasses. Why, what's the importance of them? Well, they, they are very important. And that's why we have this interest in grasses. Um, in Ireland, we have roughly 100 native or, or naturalized and alien grasses. Um, and these are comprised of about 40 different genera altogether. So grass species are very adaptable and they, they occur everywhere from wet to dry conditions, um, clay, calcareous soil to maybe kind of peaty acidic soils. So these conditions that they grow on will determine um, the kind of grass species that you're going to find. And so if you know what grasses are growing in an area, you can actually tell what, you know, there's information there about the type of soil that's there. Um, maybe how wet the soil is, how much nutrients are in the soil, um, how acidic or how calcareous it is. And you don't even need to go and do a soil test or to dig up the soil and look at it. The grasses that grow there will be able to give you a fair indication of that. So in terms of studies then, you can have agricultural studies that might look at um, the types of grasses that will grow in certain conditions. And this will help um, grassland managers, such as farmers, to, to know what works best on their land. Or you could have ecological studies in which you look at the grasses and other plants that grow there. And you can actually identify whether the habitats are of conservation value. So if we want to conserve these valuable habitats, well, we can't really conserve them if we don't know what we have. So grasses and grass species make up a huge proportion of those kind of um, valuable habitats. So this, this all helps. So the more information we have and the more well able we are to identify the grasses, the better we can characterize all the different habitats that we come across. So what do you actually need to ID grasses? Well, the good news is you don't really need a whole lot. Um, you need some ID books, and I go through these now, and you need hand lens, uh, some kind of a magnifying glass, just to help you to see some of the, maybe the smaller features um, in a bit more detail. So the first uh, book, I suppose, that I would recommend or um, talk about is Hubbard. Uh, that's a small little grass book. Um, this is it here. It's sort of, it used to be an industry standard, if you like. Um, it's a bit out of date now, taxonomically things, species names have changed, um, but it's, and it's, it's kind of out of print as well, so you might be able to get it second hand, um, but it, it has excellent diagrams and it's, it's a good reference book. And I suppose the, the sort of follow-up to it in a way was, is the, the SBI handbook, which also has great diagrams. It's tried to make the keys a bit more accessible um, and it's, it's definitely um, a great one to have if you're trying to get into grasses. The um, National Bio, uh, the MBDC, National Biodiversity Data Centre. This nice small little book here, um, Identification Guide to Ireland's Grasslands. It's really nice and portable. It's got some good keys, like it's got a great vegetative key and it's got um, nice pictures and photos of the common grasses you're going to come around. And it, it covers most of the common species that you're going to find in Ireland. So from that point of view, it's a really useful book to have and it's very reasonable as well. Webb's Irish Flora, various um, iterations of it. Um, this is my tatty copy here, uh, which you'll also see down in the corner here. Um, there's a new version, uh, which is a bit big to bring out in the field, but um, both the old versions and the new versions have um, good sections for keying out flowering grasses. So well worthwhile if you can get your hands on that. And then there's a couple of other books like the Collins Guide, um, just uh, kind of a small guide, but again, some really nice illustrations. And this one here with the hardback 
why France is rose. So again, these you don't have to have all of these, obviously, but to have even one or two of them in your arsenal is very handy. Um, the portable ones are really good for bringing out in the field. So um, in terms of hand lenses, you can get all sorts of different hand lenses. They need not cost that much. You can get them online at various um, suppliers in Ireland and the UK. Um, there's different types, as I say, a times 10 hand lens. So multiplying things by 10, they're probably a, a kind of a standard one that you'd use for grasses and just botany in general. You can go higher if you want, um, times 20 maybe. But to be honest, a times 10 is, is perfectly fine for, for grasses. Um, sometimes you can get ones that have two parts of them, like this one here. I think this is a times eight and a times 15. You can get ones with a times 10 and 20 and so on. So there's different types out there. Even if you just get a magnifying glass, just something that'll help you to see the hairs up close or the ligule when I'm talking about that, then these will all, uh, they'll really help, help you with your whole kind of grass journey. Um, so they're the main things. So what else do you need? Um, enthusiasm, definitely. Um, always helps. A uh, bit of patience because you may not necessarily get these things straight away. So just be patient with yourself, be kind, and uh, just bit by bit things will, things will work out. And finally perseverance. You really do need to persevere. It's very easy to lose uh, lose heart with these kind of things because grasses, they're, they're not the easiest of groups, but if you persevere with them, you'll definitely get there. So why? Why are grasses feared so much? Uh, you know, you, you talk to people and they say, oh, grasses, God, they're really hard. You know, how, how do you do them? How do you know them? And um, it's, it's just so, they're so difficult. So, you know, why, why do people have this perception? Well, they all look alike. <laughs> so people think they all look alike. And, you know, maybe at first glance, there's no doubt there is a certain similarity between them. Um, but to be honest, they don't all look alike. So if you, if you look at the picture here that I showed you at the beginning, um, beautiful grassy sward here with other, other um, perennial herbs as well, uh, broadleaf herbs rather. Um, so here, for instance, we have this grass here, which is crested dog's tail. This is it here again when it's flowering properly, if you like. And here's an, a different grass, very different, clearly not the same as this one here. Uh, this is your Yorkshire fog. Um, so this has a much more spread out head. And this long elongated one here is your perennial rye grass. And then you've other ones kind of mixed in things like uh, festuca. So you've got your fescues. Um, I know it's here somewhere. I just can't see it at the moment. So there's probably a fescue there. Um, so there's at least three or four different species in there that you can just make out from the flowering head alone. So, you know, they're not all alike. They, they're similar. <laughs> um, and in a case like this, I'm showing you um, your perennial rye grass and one of the couch grasses you'd say mm, they're very similar aren't they but if you look more closely if you look at this part of the, the flowering head this is the spikelet of lolium of the perennial ryegrass and the flat bit of the spikelet is facing you like this so they're they're all facing you like this but if you look at this one here this is your couch grass um probably sea couch it's got a similar kind of a shape spikelet, but instead of facing you, it's actually kind of side on to the stem like this, side on to the, the flowering stalk, uh, to the axis of the inflorescence. So there's a different arrangement there. So they superficially look quite similar, but actually there is a difference. Same with this one here. So this is um, coxfoot, a very common tusky grass that you see um, on road verges. And this is the Yorkshire fog again. You see Yorkshire fog cropping up quite a bit in this presentation. Um, so again, kind of similar. You've got this sort of vaguely triangular um, shape to the inflorescence. But these 
Coxwood here has these sort of agglomerated or kind of globular um, structures and um, spikelets, whereas these are much more spread out, a bit more feathery, if you like. And finally, these kind of spiky headed grasses here, especially these two. This is um, meadow foxtail and this is timothy. Um, these are quite similar as well, but they, they grow at different times of the year and there are structural differences as well um, in the inflorescence. And here again is your crested dog's tail, which again has a superficially similar look, but they're all actually very different once you get to know them. So the devil's in the detail really, you look, you look at your um, plants in a bit more detail and like everything else, you get to know, the better you get to know a species, then the better you get to see how it differs from other similar species. Another thing people say is that you know, they all kind of grow in together and you can't really separate them out and you know they're they're all they're all a bit of a mishmash. And again that is true um, but there there can be differences in even their growth form so their habit um, that can help you to distinguish one from the other. So for instance you have um, the likes of creeping bench for instance has this kind of a creeping mat forming sort of a growth. Um, if you don't, uh, for instance, manage your, um, the edge of your lawn, like I don't, then you will have these sort of uh, creepy out stoloniferous um, above ground stems that sort of spread out um, across the, the pavement. Or you have these much more tufted forms of grasses, which rather than forming big mats, they, they form tufts, which can um, just form, if you like, almost separate structures here and there. So just a bit more on growth habit then. Um, so above ground horizontal stems are called stolons. So the likes of your creeping bend, very typical. Um, you have um, above ground stems and they just travel across the, the top of the ground their vegetative uh, method of reproduction. And then below ground, um, horizontal stems are called rhizomes. And if you have very short rhizomes, then what you get are tufted plants. So it might still have rhizomes, but they're really, really short. So it's as if it's all the plants are kind of growing one on top of the other. And this is just an example of just a sort of a, a separated out stolon of your creeping bench across the stolonifera. So at each of these uh, little, at the end of each of these stolons, you have a shoot coming up and you'd likely have roots um, coming out as well. <clears throat> so that's how the plant spreads uh, without needing to resort to seeds or anything like that. It has seeds as well, but it can spread in two ways. The other thing people say, and this is very true, um, all the easy to ID bits get either eaten by cattle or cut by mowers. So what do you do then? Um, and unfortunately, yes, that is absolutely true. And it's, it's partly the secret of, the secret to their success is because they are really quite um, robust plants. They, they're constructed in such a way that they can, withstand kind of cattle grazing them all the time, constant grazing, constant mowing. So the growing point of the plant is actually kind of almost at ground level. So it's, even when it's cut back, it's able to grow again and grow again. So it's really the reason why grasses have spread so well throughout the world, particularly with the, the development or the, the evolution of grazers throughout the world. But even though you might, the flowering parts of the plant may be gone, there's lots of vegetative characters. So characters to do with the, the structure of the plant itself that can actually help you to ID them all year round, even when you don't have a flowering head. So I'm not going to poach too much on Linda's territory here. Linda Weeks is going to be giving, um, the next two webinar, webinars will be on vegetative um, grass ID. And this, 
again, this is, while I'm giving you an introduction here, she'll be able to open up your world even more to, to what you can, what you can ID based on just certain characteristics of the graphic as well. So I will just go through, again, I'll bring you through the structure of grasses. So as I say, I'll just deconstruct them for you. And again, um, all the information I'm giving you here really is to help you when you go and look up ID books or look through a key and you're trying to work out what grass do I have, then the information I'm giving you here will help you with finding your way through those keys and navigating through them. So um, the first um, the first thing there is your non-flowering shoot. So your uh, root stems and leaves. So roots here, your stem and your leaves. So the main part really of the grasses that people see is the leaf. So the leaves attach to the stem. Uh, usually there's kind of a, a little bulge there. Uh, and then the flowering head may develop then later on in the season. And for instance, at the moment, June, July, great time for seeing grasses in flower. So it's a really good time to actually get out there and look at what's out there now. And you'll be able to see the differences between them when they're in flower. So the flowering head is also called an inflorescence. Um, and that arises from the top of the shoot. So the grass leaf is really important um, if you're trying to ID grasses and it's in two main parts. So the first part is the blade, which is the flat part of the, the grass that we're used to seeing. And really it's kind of what we would generally refer to as the grass leaf. Um, but it's strictly speaking, what you're talking about is the blade of the grass, the, the leaf blade, also called the lamina. And then the second part is the sheath. So this is the bit that, if you like, wraps around the stem proper. And then at the very base of the sheath, the whole leaf joins onto the stem at the node. In between your blade and sheath, you have this area here. Um, and there's, there's lots of stuff going on there um, in terms of ID. Um, or characteristics that will help you with the ID. So what's happening here? So here we have um, your stem, your, your culm, and your leaf coming off here. And where your leaf and your sheath join, you have a ligule. So a ligule is just like a flap of tissue, a little membranous flap of tissue, usually. Um, and then you may also have this little, these little outgrowths uh, where the leaf blade and the sheath come together. And these are called, these are oracles. Um, they're called oracles because they, they're vaguely shaped like an ear, if you use your imagination. So the oracles then, they can be maybe big ones, uh, can be big kind of pointy clasping ones. Um, so the example given there is hordium, which is barley, some species of barley. Also the likes of the couch grasses. Um, perennial ryegrass has kind of, sometimes has very pronounced um, oracles like that. Sometimes you can have hairs at the oracle. And other times you have quite a big fringe of hairs and that can be diagnostic as well for certain species. So oracles are just little, outgrowths that sometimes occur at the junction between your leaf blade and your sheath. And then just a little look at the ligule itself. The ligule is probably one, one of the more important um, characters, vegetative characters that is used in graph ID. Comes in all shapes and sizes. Um, it can be really long pointed like this, as for example, uh, Coxfoot has a very pointed uh, ligule. It can be quite flat and maybe short like um, common bent. And let's have a look at this one down here in the corner, a rim of hairs. So instead of having <clears throat> a flap of membranous tissue, it's actually got just a rim of hairs instead. So 
nice thing about uh, ligules that are composed of a rim of hairs is that in Ireland, we only have four of them, really. So first one is heath grass, Danconi decumbens. Um, this is a diagram from Hubbard, which shows you the fringe of hairs of the ligule. And it, it's also quite hairy at the junction between the leaf blade and the sheath. And this is a photo of it here. So really very hairy here, hairy there, but even across the ligule here as well, you can actually see that instead of having a flap of tissue there, there is actually a fringe of hairs. Purple moorgrass, very common species on kind of uplands and heaths and maybe um, overgrazed heaths as well. Um, again, very distinguishable by the habitat, but particularly also by this fringe of hairs for the ligule. Common cord grass, which you'll find on salt marshes. And finally, the common reed, Phragmites hostilis. So, so yes. So once you see a ligule composed of a fringe of hairs, then basically you know it's one of those four. Great. So this is another ligule here. This is one that is a, a, a definitely a membranous um, flap of tissue. So the other thing um, that you could look at um, on your plant uh, around the leaf and the sheath is whether there are hairs. So sometimes there are kind of hairs either on the leaf blades or on the leaf sheath or on both, or it may have it just on one and not on the other. So again, these are all kind of diagnostic characters or characters that will at least help you identify, is it this species or is it another one? So let's look at the flowering head then. And as I showed you there in the earlier slide when I was looking through the different um, types of grasses in that beautiful sward, um, you've got two main types of flowering head. So the first one is called a spike. So a spike has very simple kind of an arrangement here. So if this is your kind of main axis of your inflorescence of your flowering head, <clears throat> Then these little red dots here um, represent spikelets. So spikelets, I will explain to you in a minute. Um, but it means you have an arrangement that's something like this. Okay, this is also a, a, a type of spike. It's a sort of a cylindrical spike rather than a, a kind of a, a flattened sort of spike like this. But essentially you have your um, spikelets, the little flowering part of your grass, they're all arranged in quite a little, a tight arrangement like this. And the second type of flowering head you might come across then is the panicle. So the panicle has this sort of a much looser arrangement. So you might have, if you think of nodding grasses in the fields, you know, with the flowering heads that are sort of blowing in the breeze, it's probably this kind of a flowering head is what you're thinking of. So here's our Yorkshire fog again. And this also here is um, a flowering head of the grossus, so the bent, probably the creeping bent. And these have a very loose kind of an arrangement. Um, you can see these are kind of stalks here and there's other little stalks that hold up the various flowering parts of the of the grass. Something else you could look at, and that's um, something that the uh, Biodiversity Data Centre handbook refers to, is whether the inflorescence is one-sided. So has it an obvious back and front. So something like Coxfoot, for instance, it's got loads of, if you turn it one side, you see lots and lots of um, flowers. You can't really see the central kind of um, axis of the flowering head. <clears throat> Whereas if you turn it round to the back, then you can see, you know it's the back because there's, you know, it's just, there's nothing there. Everything else is sort of facing towards the front. So Coxwood is one such example. Uh, 
And <clears throat> crested dog's tail is another one. So again, we saw that in the slide earlier on. This is the back of crested dog's tails where um, all the, the flowers tend to be facing towards the front, away from the back axis here. So this one here is pretty much facing towards the front. And that one is the back. So let's uh, drill down, if you like, into the inflorescence and have a look at the constituent parts of this. So this might all seem quite technical, and I will agree it, it kind of is. Um, but it does, again, as I say, my, my aim is to try and help you through um, a key or an ID book so that you'll know what the, the author is talking about when they're throwing out these terms. So the spikelet, the sort of unit of the inflorescence of the flowering head. The ratchets is just the central axis onto which the spikelets are joined. <clears throat> and then your spikelet may be attached to the ratchets with a tiny little stalk. So this here is your small little stalk. Or as in the case of the Lolium perenne, the perennial ryegrass here. The spikelet is actually attached directly to the ratchets and there's no little stalk at all. So these are called sessile or unstalked spikelets. So if you have a pedestal, if you have a stalk, then usually what you'll be looking at is some kind of a, a panicle rather than a spike. So let's look at the spikelet. Okay, so the spikelet is made up of a number of different parts. And essentially your, your one spikelet here is, it's got two kind of scale-like, leaf-like things at the bottom, which are called the glooms. Um, so you, you've got a lower gloom, which is the one right next to the, the stalk and you've got an upper gloom. And if you like, these enclose the rest of the spikelet. And within the glooms, uh, encased, you know, more or less um, by the glooms, you have one or many different florets. And these florets are what actually hold the flowering parts of the, of the plant, of the grass. I'll come to the on in a minute, which is the bristle. So this um, hairy brome here is quite a nice example. You can see your spikelets there. So there, there's your pedestal. That's your little stalk of your spikelets. Um, each of them here, you've got your lower, your upper and your lower glooms at the very bottom. And then you've got a number of florets that are enclosed within uh, those two glooms to form a single spikelet. And you can see very clearly that there are um, lots of bristles or awns coming out of um, the top as well. <clears throat> so I quite like this little diagram here. Um, it's sort of, again, showing you the constituent parts of the, the different parts of the spikelet. So here's your spikelet in its entirety. That's your it's made up of two glooms, your lower gloom, your upper gloom. It's made up of a number or, well, one or many florets. These are your florets. And these little florets are attached to a small little axis in the middle of the spikelet. You needn't worry too much about that, but it's just kind of nice to know that they all, they all fit together somewhere. And then your florets are actually made up of a number of parts as well. So you've got your lemma and your palea. And then within that is you have your flowering, the actual bread and butter parts of the, of the grass, the bits that do all the, the hard work in reproduction and so on. Strangely enough, they don't really come into ID that much. Mostly you're looking at the structure of the plant, um, the spikelets, the kind of construction of the spikelets and the inflorescence and so on. Um, so even though these are the hardworking bits of the grass, they don't really feature in ID that much at all. 
Okay. So to summarize, you can have one or florets in a spikelet and your spikelet is surrounded by two leaf-like glooms. So here's a, another representation. Your lower gloom, your upper gloom, and then you've got one floret here, your lemma and your palea, and you've another floret here, your lemma and your palea, and then your anthers and your uh, reproductive bits of the, the grass are held within that. Okay. So what about alms? I hear you ask, and indeed, well, what about them? <laughs> um, so they are essentially a bristle that is present in some grasses. Not all grasses have them by any means, um, but where they're present, they can actually be helpful in, in um, as a diagnostic aid, so to help you what kind of, tell you what grass you actually have. So they can be very long, uh, like your wall barley here, or they can be fairly short, like the, the red fescue I showed you earlier on. Um, or they can be absent. Uh, they can be present on the glooms or the lemmas, so either the two little chappy scaly bracts at the bottom of your spikelet or on the lemmas that occur on every single flourish. And they can arise from the tip of either the gloom or the lemma or from part way down the back. And as a final twist, they can be straight or they can be bent. So here's an example here, uh, your false oat grass. Um, so the awn is long and it's bent uh, and it also arises part way down the back of the lemma, about two thirds of the way actually down the back. And this is, uh, this is how it looks in the flesh as it were. And then our red fescue has a short awn, you can just see it there as a bristle at the tip. Um, it's very straight and it arises from the tip of the lemma. So other pictures then that would help you with ID are, um, again, these are sort of vegetative characters and I'm, I'm not going to go into these in any detail because I know Linda Weeks will be going through um, a lot of these or all of these characters next in the next two weeks. So I talked about the ligule and the oracle already. There are other characters to do with your leaf shape, um, the shape of the leaf tip and the leaf sheath, whether it's open or closed, uh, whether it's hairy or whether it's not. Uh, the presence of hairs generally on the plant is, is pretty faithful to each species. So if you have a plant with hairs, um, it's unlikely just to be, you know, just that one. It's a characteristic of the species. So the presence or absence of hairs is a very useful diagnostic characteristic. Are the leaves folded or rolled in the shoot? And again, I'm sure Linda will be going into a bit more detail on this next week. What's the growth habit of the plant? So is it creeping or is it tufted? And I spoke about that earlier on. And another very important thing, and it's <clears throat> kind of basic, but in a way it's easy to forget about it sometimes, is where is the plant actually growing? So what habitat is it growing in? So for instance, is it in a, a wet kind of heathy habitat like this? Um, you can be sure that there's quite a lot of uh, purple moorgrass or Melania cerulea growing in a habitat like this, and probably a lot of that like this stuff, some of it is likely to be millennia. Is it growing by the sea? Uh, maybe on sand dunes? So you can see here, this kind of a gray green uh, grass here um, is actually um, marum grass. So that's characteristic of sand dunes. You're not gonna find it growing in a wet heathy habitat, um, dry, sandy, kind of salt, salt um, saltier habitats. Um, particularly where you've got kind of dunes forming and um, building up and the marum grass actually helps in the whole uh, dune building process. Are you on a salt marsh? So here out on the salt marsh, just, you can just about see this kind of um, almost bristly looking quite erect grass growing here. 
This is um, probably Spartina. I think there's quite a bit of Spartina cord grass growing um, on this particular site. Uh, and then you've got other grasses that may grow at the edge of salt marsh, like um, for instance, your common couch and your red fescue. They are actually very common in salt marsh areas as well, particularly on the upper marsh. So where, where you are, the habitat you're in is another big, um, big help to you when you're trying to decide what your grass is actually called. Are you in a limestone area? Um, a lot of this grass growing here could well be something like your blue moor grass, your Cesleria cerulea, um, or other um, kind of limestone loving plants like your Brysomedia, your quaking grass. So all very useful information to know. And I, I just, um, as a sort of an introduction to my run through some of the more common species that we've come across, I just thought it would be useful to show you a table um, of the frequency of grass species that um, we, in the course of recording um, releves for the um, Seminatural Grassland Survey, um, the frequency of grass species in the plots across all of the grassland habitats that we surveyed. So the most common species that we came across in our vegetation plots is Holcus lanatus, which is your Yorkshire fog, which is the one I've been showing you pictures of all through this presentation. Um, Anthosanthum moderatum, which is a sweet vernal grass. It's, and I, I'll be going through each of these now just um, to show you the characteristics of them your red fescue, your creeping bent, your common bent, and so on. Um, there's a few other species then down near the, near the end, like your Brysomedia, media, which is your quaking grass, which is really characteristic of calcareous places. So there's quite, um, definitely the first five or six, um, actually probably the first 10 of them, are really common ones that you, you could find just walking around your local neighborhood um, in even some kind of amenity grassland or slightly rougher areas of unworn grassland that some of the councils are leaving now as well. So these are good ones to just to try and get to grips with. So my, my caveat with that list is that it doesn't include some common species of grassy verges like false oat grass, which is a really common grass. But we didn't, as a, as a regular routine, we didn't put, um, we didn't record plots in grassy verges, for instance. Um, it doesn't include um, common species like annual meadow grass, which tend to grow in improved amenity grassland or kind of trampled places. And it also, that list doesn't include species of sand dunes and salt marshes and, if you like, non kind of classical grass, grassland habitats. But in terms of grasslands, these are your main, your main species. So if you can get your head around even the first 10 of those, you'll be doing well. So let's um, just, I'm going to go through each of these species in turn just to give you some of the characteristics of them and that would maybe help you to identify them later on. So if you're going out for your walk later on today, you can kind of look and study the plant in its entirety and say, oh yeah, look, I can see that character there. Um, that's what she was talking about with the, you know, hairs on the leaf or the sheath or whatever. So this is Yorkshire fog, Alcus linatus, very common grass. Um, it's hairy, so it's hairy on the sheath, and it's also hairy on the leaves. It's quite downy, um, it feels quite furry. Um, the inflorescence is usually an open panicle like this. Um, I'll show you a couple of variations in a second. And classically, it's got these, well, all the, the uh, botanists kind of refer to as these striped pajamas these um, purple striped pajamas, the sheets at the bottom, um, especially where they are nearly attached to the soil. 
they have these purple stripes, very distinctive, um, pretty much always present. Uh, so it's a great diagnostic character. And that's why Yorkshire fog is probably any grass that you can identify without having to go to too much trouble. To me, that's a good grass. So here's your um, Holcus lunatus with its stripy pajamas. Really nice, easy one to identify. Usually. <laughs> so here you have, uh, this is also Holcus lunatus, but it's kind of before, <clears throat> excuse me, before the inflorescence actually opens out properly. This is it when it's open. And this is it either as a kind of a white form or sometimes later on in the season, it has this kind of a tired whitish look to it as well. So how old your inflorescence is can affect how it looks. And we'll see that in a second as well with um, creeping then. A very similar species to Halcus linatus is this creeping soft grass. And this is another one that botanists love because you look at it and you see, oh, look, there's hairs on the node. So everyone goes, oh, hairy knees. So hairy knees is a great characteristic for Halcus mollus. It's an awful shame that it's not all that common because it's just so nice and easy to identify when you see it. You just know, gosh, so you could have maybe hardly any hairs here at the top part of the sheet, hardly any hairs maybe below the node, but on the node itself, you've got hairs and it's just such a great diagnostic character, uh, really useful. So if you've got a, a plant that looks like Yorkshire fog but has hairy knees, then you're talking about half the smallest. Now, sweet vernal grass, Anthosanthum odoratum, very um, common grass really, as we found in, in semi-natural grassland. Um, it can be quite variable in that this is it when it's young, this is it when it's just past flowering, and this is it when it's dead, um, kind of in the, probably about this time of year. Um, it actually, it's an early flowering species and it, it dies off quite early. Um, but the big diagnostic character with it is these hairs at the jaw of the leaf blade and the sheath. So sometimes it kind of has sort of pseudo oracles kind of outgrowths a little bit. But the main thing is that it's got hairs at the junction of the sheath and the blade. Not necessarily on the ligule itself but at the junction. So it's called a bearded ligule. So there are hairs where the ligule meets the blade. And also, if you crush it, you get this kind of lovely smell of new mown hay. And it's basically what gives new mown hay its smell. Um, so that is another nice characteristic of that particular species. Red fescue, very common. Um, it's got bristle-like leaves, so very narrow, um, quite folded. It's very common in lawn mixes now. Um, and the <clears throat> diagnostic character, one of the diagnostic characters is on the vegetative shoots. This is important, not the flowering shoots. Your leaf sheath, we show it here. <clears throat> your leaf sheath is closed. And there are also hairs on the leaf sheath as well. So important to remember that this sheath character is for the vegetative shoot only. Once it starts flowering, then it actually kind of rips through the sheet so it can look like it's open, but it's actually closed. It's completely sealed. And red fescue can also form swathes on coastal headlands. This is all red fescue. Beautiful. So it can form these kind of springy turfs, um, really kind of springy surface um, on coastal headlands. Creeping bent, very common grass, uh, extremely common and grows practically everywhere. It usually grows in kind of damp places, but you will also find it in dry places. Um, it gets its name, Stolonifera, from the fact that it, it forms these stolons, so these creeping over, over overground stems from which a new plant arises. So 
this diagram here from Hubbard um, shows how the inflorescence actually contracts when it has finished flowering. And that can be a useful character um, if you come across the grassland in maybe July, um, maybe August with um, flowering heads are still present. Um, but they're all quite contracted like this, then it could well be a gross stolonifera. And if you see this kind of a creeping sort of growth form, then that's quite likely. Um, it's got quite a long ligule, um, maybe not always as obviously pointed as that. Usually it'll be quite ragged, so not necessarily as neat looking as that. Um, and you, it, it can grow in very wet places as well. So you will sometimes find it almost as a, a floating thing at the edge of maybe a, a pool of long kind of semi-permanent water. But it's so common. Um, and it doesn't really have a huge amount of really distinguishing characteristics, which um, doesn't really help. Um, a grossus stolonifera and a grossus capillaris, so your creeping bent and your common bent are quite similar. Um, but a grossus stolonifera tends to have um, that medium length of ligule. So this kind of a ligule here, but I would tend to think of it more as being quite ragged. Um, whereas a grossus capillaris has a much shorter ligule. Um, the other thing is that, as I say, a grossus stolonifera, the inflorescence here contracts after it's flowering, so it, it sort of closes up. Whereas that does not happen with grossus capillaris. And that's actually quite a, a useful character in the field. Crested dog's tail, really distinctive in flower. Um, there's nothing else really that looks like it in Ireland. Um, very distinctive. Uh, when it's not in flower, it's actually quite, it's a bit ho-hum, it's, it's quite generic, so it's quite hard to distinguish from other grasses when it's not in flower. But again, I'm sure Linda will give some nice characters on that later. And <clears throat> perennial ryegrass then, your lolium perenne, um, which we had a look at earlier on, you've got your spikelets here, they're flat. And there are sometimes oracles at the, well, usually there are oracles. They may not be very big at the junction between the leaf blade and the sheath. And the other thing is that the back of the leaf is really glossy and it gives lolium fields their kind of characteristic shiny appearance when the wind is blowing through them um, and the sun is shining on them. You just see this sort of shine in the air. Um, and the leaves are actually also quite strong and quite twangy. So if you pull them like that and sort of snap, it almost makes a twanging sound without breaking. So they're quite strong leaves. Now I'm conscious of time here. Um, it's nearly 11 o'clock, um, but I am going to press on with a couple of more species and then I will finish um, just with some advice on, if you like, going forward. Um, so I'll just push through a few more of these species and the rest of them will be available on the recorded version anyway. So Coxfoot, uh, Dactylus glomerata, again, a really common species. Um, particularly in hedgerows or hedge banks, uh, grassy verges and so on, it forms these big tufts and the, the shoots are very flattened as you can just about maybe make out here. Um, the colour of them is a bit more blue-green looking than, than this would indicate. Um, and the ligule is very long and pointed. Now this isn't actually a great picture of it in that it looks quite tatty there. If it was um, a typical um, unbroken ligule of Dactylus lamorata, you would see that it's, it's quite tri triangular and pointed and it's maybe up to here. So it's really long. It's like 0.5 or even one centimeters long. And it's very distinctive as a grass. Again, there's nothing else really that looks like it. 
Poa trivialis is a rough meadow grass. Again, you'll find that quite a lot in unmown grassland, um, particularly in the likes of parks, um, county council parks and so on, often in quite damp places. Um, Poa trivialis has a lot of teas going on. It's, it's quite a triangular plant. So the inflorescence is particularly triangular looking. Um, it's got a triangular pointed ligule, which you can see here. The leaf is triangular because it's sort of broad at the bottom and then tapers gradually towards the tip. So think of Poa trivialis, triangular, everything's triangular. Um, at least if you have it down to a Poa, then you'll be able to tell if it's Poa trivialis. Leaf sheath colour can be a bit misleading sometimes. Poa trivialis can have this um, purple sheath colour at the base, but then other ones do as well. Um, here you can see it's quite a tufted plant with lots of plants arising from the same place. So the colour thing, use it with caution maybe, but it, it can uh, indicate certain different types of leaf sheath. I'm going to move on. Um, to through through my other meadow grasses, um, my smooth meadow grass, purple moor grass. Um, I have described the hairy ligule of this already. So ligule is a fringe of hair. It grows on heathy places. Quaking grass. I mention it mainly because it's just beautiful grass, <laughs> and it grows in um, calcareous places. And its, um, its relatives are used in flower arrangements. Such a distinctive grass, you really can't mix it up with anything else except maybe one of the other um, species within the genus. But uh, it's always a sign of good grassland, really, when you come across it. Um, I will skip through the couch grasses and I will skip through the false oat grass. Um, again, I I showed you characteristics of the awn for that species. And Timothy, Liam Potensi, and Meadow Foxtail. Um, just to mention one difference between these, um, it's to do with the spikelet. So the spikelet in Timothy has these sort of two prongs or bristles or awns, short awns, whereas Meadow Foxtail only has one and it's quite a long awn like this. So Meadow Foxtail is much softer plant and it also flowers much earlier in the year. The Timothy is only coming out now really, kind of June, July. So if you want to go further with grasses, um, I would advise you to start with grasses you know, so the really common ones. Um, so initially, even for the one you know, get used to using a key so that you can work your way through the key and if you come to the wrong answer and well, you'll know you're wrong, which is really useful. Um, so you'll use your key in your ID books initially. Um, start small, so get to know the common species really well, and then you can kind of progress to the more difficult species later on. Get used to looking for distinguishing features like bristle-shaped leaves or hairy plants, or is, what's your ligule? Is it composed of hairs? Is it short? Is it long and pointed? And so on. So even if you don't identify the plant as such, at least identify the distinguishing characteristics. And eventually then, you won't even have to go to the books, you'll just recognize it yourself. And that's such a great feeling once you actually start, once you get to that stage. For vegetative ID then, if you want to take things on even further, um, I'd advise you to uh, register for Linda's course. Um, in the next two webinars, she's going to be going through characteristics of vegetative ID because, let's face it, grasses, as we know, are very often not flowering. Um, so it's really nice to be able to identify them when, you know, all year round. And they grow all year round, so it's really handy um, to know the vegetative characteristics as well. This is a great time of year to be looking at grasses, so get out and start looking at them now because they're in flower, um, provided you don't have hay fever. I hope you don't. Um, it can be quite painful if you do, um, but if you look at them when they're in flower, then as I say, this is the time to do it. Get to know a botanist, 
Okay, that'll always help you. Um, botanists generally, in my experience, are very generous about sharing their knowledge and experience with beginners. Um, I know some of you watching this presentation already are botanists, so you know how generous and giving you are. Um, and finally, I would advise joining the BSBI. Now, they haven't asked me to, to say this, but um, I, I feel very strongly that BSBI is a great group. Um, if you're trying to get to know plants, just go out on the field outings once it's actually safe to do so, uh, once these COVID-19 restrictions will allow. Uh, so hopefully the field outings will, will resume um, in the not too distant future. Great opportunity to meet botanists, to get out and see different plants, different habitats, get to see the grasses, get to see lots of other stuff as well. So Mila Wilkes, everybody, thank you very much. And again, thanks to BSBI for inviting me um, to do this talk. So over to you, Sarah. Thank you. On to some questions then. Um, one person asked, does Potravialis have stolons? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, I know it can grow tufted. Um, I don't normally associate it with stolons, but I, I'll be honest, I would have to look it up. Um, I, yeah. <laughs> okay, that's, that's a great success. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it just goes to show that grasses can be quite tricky, can't yeah. they? <laughs> yes, yes. I, I, as a gut thing, I would say probably not. I think if anything, it has maybe short rhizomes rather than stolons. But I would have to look it up to check. Excellent. Thanks for that. <laughs> I'm trying to look through the questions and a lot of them are actually just saying thank you so much and a brilliant presentation. So that's good. Uh, Maria, I think you were looking through questions and answering some as we went yeah. well, wrong, wrong. Yeah. Thanks for that. Yeah, so I had a couple and yeah, I, uh, I sent the link to the project website to numerous people because lots of people were asking, can we have the slides? Will you send us a copy of the talk? So the best thing I think for everybody to do is over the coming weeks, all of these presentations will be put up on the BSBI Irish Grasslands Project website. So you can Google it and for a lot of you have already sent the link. So that's the best place to do. Check back in there and the talks will be up online. Um, a couple of questions that because they were coming in thick and fast, Sarah, and you had a lot going yeah. on. So there's two questions that might be useful to put to Fanula. And again, don't worry if you can't answer them, Fanula. But one, a couple of people were interested in knowing more about how the grasses tell you about the soil, both the condition and the nature of the soil. Mm. Somebody was asking, are there any good books or resources where they might find out more? Um, well, there. Are, I mean, there are things called, you know, Ellenberg values, which, um, if you like, assign a value to plants depending on whether they're good indicators or whether they indicate high we say high nitrogen or um, acidic pH or whatever um, I don't know Marie do you know of any publications yourself I mean off the top of my head no the Ellenberg yeah. uh, would be so E-L-L-E-N B-E-R-G -E -E so people yeah. google that there's a, a free to download publication it's a little out of date now but the, uh, the contents still stand and it mm, tells you as many says, yeah. it tells you for all the different plant species not just grasses it tells you whether they like light or shade mm. high nutrients low nutrients high moisture or dry sites so it's really fantastic if you want to know about the characteristics and when you've got a suite of grasses or plants in an area mm. You can then look at the Ellenberg values and that tells you together, gives you a picture of the soils and the conditions of a site. So yeah, that's the thing that would come to my mind first off. Yeah. I'm, yeah. Sure, there are, I'm sure there are, we can have a think about that. I'm sure there are um, some publications out there, out there. That, that, yeah. that are more, like that's a book of tables. So you want to mm. really know what you're, uh, yeah. you want to really be into the data to look at that. It's not complex, but it is data-based. I'm sure there's some uh, verbal text out there that, that might yeah. be Yeah, and I mean, certainly in, in the, the plant books and so on, they would, they would indicate whether the plant tends to grow in calcareous conditions or, yeah. um, you know, peaty conditions, acidic or whatever. So usually there will be some indication um, in the, the plant ID books themselves. Sorry, just, just to hark back, um, because this, this bugged me then about the poor trivialis. Um, apparently it has creeping leafy stolons, but um, ah. it's loosely tufted. Yeah, so, um, yeah. to me too. For hey, all so who knew? 
Which um, it looks just yeah, some, like someone did point in the questions that according to Stace, it says often procumbent tillers, some becoming stolen. Right. There you so go. There you go. There you go. <laughs> the girls, you both have your passbooks books beside yes, you right there, yes, do you? Yes. <laughs> I don't, but Teresa Higgins does in the uh, question <laughs> session. So thank you for that. <laughs> there was a second question that might be of good broad interest as well. Somebody was asking about any online apps that you might recommend for identifying grasses? Um, yeah, I mean, there are well, online keys, I think you can guess, but um, this, the BSBI have a grass key? Oh, um, I I've put here. some uh, resources that are available. There, there's a grass handbook. But, yeah. Um, in terms of online resources, it's a bit limited. Yeah, I have to, I'll be honest with you. I don't tend to use the online resources myself, so I'm not, I'm not well up on them. I, I will put my hand up and say I'm not well up on them. I tend to use the books all the time um, yeah. because you usually need to get into the nitty gritty and, um, you know, that, and I would say that's what I use. Think, Fanula, a lot of the time, uh, I'm very, uh, you probably have the same thinking as me. A lot of the time, there is no substitute for being there in the field, looking yourself, you smell, you feel, you touch, you pick, you see yeah. the context. And a lot of that context is missing if you take a photo and put it into a, an app. And particularly yeah. for grasses where the features are subtle. They're small yes. and they're subtle. Yes. So I think, yeah, there, there may very well be good tools and we'd be delighted to hear about them. But yeah. it's one of the groups that perhaps the nuances that a human eye and brain can yeah, on are, are very important. No, so. just, just I mean, there the, are apps the, like, uh, sorry, the, yeah. there are some apps um, we found, well, others have, have found that the Seek app, for example, is good at not giving you inaccurate answers. So it won't okay. tell you a wrong answer very frequently, but it might not get you to species. It can, however, perhaps help you get to genus to help you narrow down yeah. what you're looking at, at the, in the key. Yeah, which um, is very But good. with any online app, uh, whether it's for identifying grasses or anything else, you should always be going back to the key and double checking mm. because errors do creep in. Yeah, and, and it's, it can be quite location specific as well. So some keys might be, um, we'd say online keys, might be geared for, we'd say Europe, I don't know. Um, whereas we only have quite a small suite of species here in Ireland. So we're dealing with much fewer species with maybe very, a lot of variation in, in, in certain conditions as well. So you just maybe have to be conscious of the limitations of these things as well. So. Excellent. Cool. Have you spotted other questions, Sarah? Uh well, there was, someone was asking about, um, are semi-natural and improved grasslands the same or, or how are they different? No, no. Uh, so <laughs> semi-natural grasslands and improved grasslands are very different things. So <clears throat> when we talk about improved grasslands, we're talking about agriculturally improved. So agricultural improvement involves things like fertilizer, maybe herbicides, usually drainage. So a very altered kind of an ecology going on there. And the, the impact of applying fertilizers and slurry and so on is that it favors the more competitive grasses um, and knocks out the, the more sensitive ones, like we say, um, Bryza, so quaking grass, you're not gonna find that in a sward that's, been, that's had slurry applied to it. So semi-improved grasslands, or sorry, semi-natural grasslands are ones that, we don't really refer to natural grasslands in Ireland because usually there has been a certain amount of modification has gone on. Um, but by and large, they're kind of, they haven't been reseeded, they haven't been plowed up. They're, they're natural and self-sustaining, if you like. Um, they may still be managed, so quite often they're managed by grazing or by mowing and grasslands in Ireland really has, have to be managed because if you don't manage them, then they eventually start reverting to scrub or um, usually to scrub actually. So grasslands need management. And I think that's a very important point to get across as well. Um, people sometimes might think, oh, we're better off just to take the cattle off and stop mowing and everything else. But what you end up with, instead of a species rich grassland, quite often might be 
a scrubby area of very dense tussocky grassland that even the birds don't care for. You know, so you just have it's 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 quite a, an easy habitat to to lose or to mismanage and it's very important to get across that grasslands need to be managed, but quite lightly managed, if you like, sometimes. And there's a lot of research going into just how much management is enough. I think following on from that, there was another sort of slightly linked question on, is grass biodiversity declining to the same extent as broadleaf biodiversity in Ireland? In Ireland, um, well, the habitat, uh, is certainly um, in a bit of trouble and I I looked at Maria's talk, um, her burn bio talk there the other evening and um, she, she very nicely went through some of the issues with um, that semi-natural grasslands are, are facing. Um, so yes, semi-natural grasslands as a habitat in general are certainly in trouble. Um, they're in trouble both from over intensification and from abandonment. So each, so you're talking about two opposite sides of the spectrum, but each is really equally damaging in its own way. Um, so yes, the habitat diversity is certainly declining. Um, once you have an intact grassland habitat, you're not really seeing the species diversity within that declining. It's just the overall habitat itself that is in trouble. So unfortunately, that is the case. Mm. So there have also been a couple of questions coming through about management, whether that's mowing or grazing in terms of, I guess, when and how frequent and, and mm. things like that. Um, do you have a couple words you might want to say on that? Yeah, sure. Um, most of the um, management that goes on in Irish grasslands, it takes place on very intensive, well, quite often very intensive um, fields. So you have maybe two or three cuts in a year. Um, it goes to silage, maybe rather than to traditional haymaking, partly because the weather that we've been getting in recent years doesn't really lend itself to having the hay out drying for long periods of time. So um, it's because of the intensification of agriculture, then you have two and three cuts a year, which does put pressure on the system. Now, if you're talking about a, a sort of a semi-natural grassland, um, if the fact that it's semi-natural probably means that the farmer is managing it in a slightly less intensive way. Um, so he may only, he or she may only cut it um, maybe once a year late, maybe in kind of August or September, or perhaps give it a, a light cut, maybe, um, maybe in late August and possibly later in the year as well. But generally, the later you can leave it, the better. Um, and, you know, try and keep it at just one cut a year instead of two or three. Um, the more cuts, then, the more chance there is of diversity being knocked out. And of course, the, the, the application of fertilizer is, is just very detrimental to grassland species biodiversity in general. Um, any, anything else, Maria, you might add to that? Because I know you, you spoke about grassland management as well. Um, well, I am uh, guilty of, of uh, Googling uh, responses to some of the other Q&As coming here for now. That's, <laughs> okay. well, that's, that's absolutely, yeah, that's that's grand. Has been I think that, that kind of hits the high spots, I think. The later, the better, um, really, is the, is the bottom line. Yeah. Um, yeah. And yeah. I don't know whether you touched on it, uh, you, you certainly did a little bit earlier when you mentioned Scrub, and somebody else has just mentioned that they're reading a very interesting book called Wilding by mm. Isabella Tree about the net estate. I'm also just near the end of that <laughs> book. It's fantastic. So um, just to really make the point that grasslands are really valuable. They've got, they support lots of species that need these open habitats. So if we mm. were to lose our nice semi-natural grasslands, we would be the poorer for it. Mm. But often there's a, a perceived um, 
kind of a conflict between that and people that believe in rewilding and we should let nature, let nature do its thing. Mm. There is no conflict whatsoever. We have space to do all of the above and there is plenty space for scrub and for taller, uh, bushier uh, elements within semi-natural grasslands. In fact, mm. they're integral. And yeah. when we assess their quality as part of uh, our work in the National Parks and Wildlife Service, it's a positive to have a certain area of scrub and taller plants and bracken. But what we don't want to do is lose all of our grasslands. So we need to manage them in a light way so that we have some open areas to support the diversity that they do support and then uh, have areas that are scrubby or taller or thorny as well. And that's yeah. a huge element and that's what's sometimes a little bit lost, obviously, you know, um, in the debate. Rewilding is such a, it means so many different things to different people. Yeah. Even at one of the best examples we have at NEP, they use grazing animals to keep the land open, not, but with lots and lots of space for scrub and natural mm. dynamics as well. And I think that's yeah. the name of the game and that's what's important to understand. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. And so it's, it's habitat diversity, diversity of habitats yeah. between yeah. habitats as much as diversity within your habitat. So yeah. and more space for natural yeah. processes. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 And also just be aware that, you know, it's not going to happen overnight necessarily. If you're going from an intensively managed fertilized plot, it, mm. it does take time to, to reduce that nutrient load, to let other plants start to come back in. Yeah. Um, so cut, cut and remove is basically if you want to try and get yes. something back to semi-natural grassland without reseeding, we'd say. So if you want to take a, a slow and steady, uh, well, a slow route, um, then cut and remove the cuttings and um, again from um, I know Maria mentioned in her previous talk about using yellow rattle as well to maybe because what that does is it's a, a sort of a, a hemi parasite of grasses so it it kind of knocks back the grasses a little bit makes them a bit less competitive so maybe gives a chance to other things to to maybe come to the fore of it and just gives a bit more chance for diversity to re-establish. Yeah. I might just take the opportunity to mention because a couple of people have asked um, it, and, it, and it ties in so nicely with this. I gave a talk a couple of weeks ago as part of the Burn Bio Trust series of webinars. Uh, well, actually, sorry, it was part of the Burn and Bloom Festival, but also for Burn Bio Trust. So if anybody wants to find that, there's a link on the BSBI Grasslands uh, Project website. But also, if you go to YouTube and put in Burren Bio Trust, the talk comes up and it's called Semi-Natural Grasslands, Our Precious Resource, yeah. something like that. Um, so it, it, it gives a re, uh, I think it gives a nice background into different types of grasslands. So if you want to, you know, if anybody's interested to get the background looking at the habitats, uh, the bigger picture rather than the species, it's, it's uh, well, I'm yeah. I feel like it's I'm a really good talk. Bad, bad <laughs> I'll blow your trumpet. <laughs> it was a good talk. <laughs> Um, so slightly changing uh, tack for just, I think we'll just do one more question because we don't want to overload people, but I will try and write up a summary of some of this session yeah. for people as well. Um, although probably not by next week to be realistic. <laughs> uh, but people were asking about the value of recording grasses in urban and suburban areas and, and reporting them and that sort of thing. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, all recording is good recording. Um, we need to know what's in our cities and our towns and villages as much as anywhere else. Um, as I say, if you, if you don't know what you have, you can't conserve it. Or, you know, it, if you know the, the constituent species in, in a, an urban grassland, for instance, I mean, you could find, God, there's 20, 30, 40 species in there. And that could give a great sense of, um, pride to an area as well in, you know, say, oh gosh, you know, I, I didn't think our little patch of green had so many species and, and then they might start looking at the butterflies and the birds and the, and the bugs that inhabit these kind of habitats as well. So it's all grist to the mill, if you like, it's, it's all information on um, um, just on the habitats and on the biodiversity and it, the yeah, knowledge is power. So, you know, the more information you have, that's absolutely great. And if you can identify things in your in your local kind of town park or whatever, then, you know, the chances are you're going to find the same species or some of the same species out when you're walking in, in the wilds of, of West Cork as well. So, you know, why not just get them locally? 
and then look out for them elsewhere as well. So I'd say absolutely, yeah, whatever will keep your interest up, definitely record in, in cities and towns and urban areas for sure. And even in your own garden, right now, BSBI yeah, still yeah, has yeah. their uh, garden wildflower hunt on the go. Yeah, so, you know, get idea. out there and record what's in your garden and let us know. <laughs> and even if you've done it earlier in the year, do it now. We're going to look at how it changes across okay. the year. So yeah, uh, just yeah, get that plug in there as well. <laughs> Vera, can I point out, somebody has asked about, do they need to re-register for the other webinars and things like that? Because we oh. still have, amazingly, 225 people are still here listening to us an hour oh. and a half later, which is really fantastic. <laughs> Yeah, I think you can take that as a great endorsement of how much people have enjoyed this on a Saturday morning. But okay. now might be a good time if, if there's any instructions you want to give Sarah for, for next yeah. week or the next steps. So we have asked people to register individually for each of the webinars. Um, if you haven't received a confirmation that you're registered, it probably means you aren't. Um, so please go back to the Irish Grasslands Project web, excuse me, web page and there are links there so that you can register. Um, and make sure that you're you're in on that. There are still places available in all the all the upcoming uh, sessions. So get in there quick, I guess. <laughs> um, and again, we will try to have all the recordings up as well. Right. Thanks. I think we'd better leave it there because it is getting a bit late. Thank you so much again, Panula, for, for yeah, your talk. It was awesome. fantastic. Great job. People really loved it. And people also really loved your wallpaper, apparently. Yes, yes. I have to agree. It's fabulous. <laughs> <laughs> the rest of us have to up our background game. Uh, thanks also to Maria for helping no um, field questions and, and all of that. Um, thanks, thanks to NPWS and CEDAR for funding the project so that we can actually offer these things. Uh, if you in the audience are, are finding this useful um, and want to support BSBI and have access to other opportunities, please consider joining. Um, and you can find all the details for that on our website. Uh, and thank you everyone for spending your Saturday morning with us. <laughs> thanks Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.